Hi, this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, founder of The Complete Herbal Guide. And today I'm very excited because we have Erwin Strommeyer. He is a credentialed and experienced professional in the field of public infection control and germ eradication, and a leader in public or community acquired infection prevention services. He has the technology to signify reduce the survival of invasive microbes in any space or facility. Most of these microbes are transported from the surface to surface by humans, and by, especially by human hands. And so he's here to tell us a little about himself and the stuff he does and to educate us on germs and prevention of germs and viruses. So Erwin, we are very happy to have you here. And can you tell us a little about yourself and what you do? First of all, Stacey, thank you for having me on today. I truly appreciate the opportunity to spread good information about how not to get sick. Yes. My company is Sterile Space Infection Defense. It's also known as the Germ Police. And as I do like to tell people, never fear, the Germ Police are here. <laughs> and uh, what we do is we work with um, basically any kind of facility, uh, residents, where we go in and we do a full decontamination of all the surfaces, equipment, and fixtures, uh, then a terminal disinfection of all the high frequency touch points. And then we finish off with a long-term antimicrobial coating, which helps significantly reduce the survival of germs on surfaces. And we take that entire encompassing picture uh, and call it our, our healthy zone service. And we warranty our services to be effective for a year. That's excellent. You know, I think people don't realize, you know, the danger of germs and infections because, you know, I myself, I caught, um, I caught encephalitis, you know, and my father swears it's because I picked up a dirty balloon and I put it in my mouth and then I came down with a virus and I came down with an ear infection. And then it's, it just, the virus kind of turned into encephalitis, which turned into epilepsy. And then, you know, I know many people that have, you know, have touched things like gone to like arcades and things like that. And they've gone out of those arcades and, you know, they come down with something, you know, overnight and they, you know, I don't understand, you know, you know, I, I must've got sick. I must've stood around somebody that got sick. Well, you could also get sick because you touch something, you know, someone wipes their nose and they put, they put their hand on the, on the machine. And then you put your hand on the machine. And also, I'm sorry to inject by just one more thing you know, our sink has over 5,000 germs in it. And we don't even realize that we think that the toilet is the most uh, air, the area with the most germs. It's actually the kitchen sink. So give us your intake about germs and viruses and how people need to be more aware of, you know, the dangers of it. I'd be happy to. First of all, according to the Centers for Disease Control, these are the germ bus. And the reason they are called the germ bus is because every time we touch a surface, we pick up whatever germs have been left there by everybody else who touched that surface. And if somebody has the flu, well, there's probably some flu germs there. And if they have the common cold, they probably have that. And if they have encephalitis, that might be there too. Right. Think about from the time you leave the house in the morning, because your house is filled with all your own germs and stuff like that, but there are still new ones that come in every day. But when you leave the house every morning, how many people, stop at their favorite place to get a cup of coffee in the newspaper. Right. Okay? And so you walk into a, you know, a, a snack shop or a coffee shop or whatever, you grab that door handle that 400 other people just this morning touched. Yes. Count everybody from yesterday and last week and last month. Okay. Now you've got those germs on your hand. Okay. Maybe, maybe you sneeze, you've touched your face. All right. Maybe you have a little itch, you've touched your eye. Maybe you feel a little something in the corner of your mouth. You go like this, okay? And like you said, a lot of people do that. So the first thing to realize is how often you get sick by what is called cross-contamination infection. And what that means is somebody with one of these moved germs from this item to that item that you touched and touched your face. People don't realize this, but you get sick approximately 80% of the time by touching a surface that's contaminated and touching your eyes, nose, or mouth. Right. Now, here's a question for you. How many times a day do you think you touch your face? Oh, I would say over 100 times, not even realizing it. Uh, it's a few more than that. Because, really? Yeah, because let's say you do one of these and one of these and one of these. That's three. 
Mm -hmm. The average person touches their face three times a minute. Wow. Okay. And in an eight hour period, I believe it is, that's like over 2,400 times in an eight hour day. Oh my gosh. Yes. So now you've gotten your paper, you've gotten your donut, you've gotten your coffee, you're headed to the office. You've got the front door of the building of the office. Yeah. You've got the elevator button. Right. Or the railing going up the stairs. Yeah. Right? The doorknob to get into the stairwell. Okay. The door on the office. Okay. You put your stuff on your desk. Maybe you want to go use the restroom. You touch all those doorknobs again. You go into the restroom and hopefully people are washing their hands. I have some really scary statistics on hand washing. <laughs> but I, I won't get into that at the moment. So anyway, one thing that people don't realize is how fast germs multiply, okay? Yeah. And germs multiply, well, let's talk about bacteria. It's the easiest one to understand. Bacteria goes through something called mitosis about every 20 minutes. And what that means is that a single bacteria cell approximately every 20 minutes goes like this. And every oh. 20 minutes. So in about a 10 hour day, a single E. coli cell. Now, you know what E. coli is, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's at the tail end. So a single E. coli cell in about 10 hours becomes somewhere over 12 million. Wow. Now, just give a brief description of what E. coli is for someone that doesn't understand, just like a sentence or two. Okay. E. coli is basically the bacterial cellular formation of feces or poop. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> And, and the thing is, you know, germs are so microscopically small that I don't even think you can see them with Superman's vision, okay? Mm -hmm. And you don't realize how many are on a surface. And just because you walk into a place that looks clean and smells clean does not mean it is biologically clean. Right, exactly. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, and what a, a lot of people misunderstand is they think that, you know, spraying some, some Windex or some 409 and wiping a surface with a paper towel and, and misting it with, with you know, something like Lysol or other, any other commercial brand of disinfectant. It's clean, it's disinfected, it's absolutely safe. Right. Wrong. Mm -hmm. Simply because, like I said, you can't see all the germs, right? right? You don't know what you've missed. And most people don't even know the right way to use a disinfectant. Yes. And this is critically important that your listeners and viewers hear because this is really the crux of the problem. If you pick up any commercially made disinfectant and you read it somewhere in the second or third paragraph on the back of the can or the bottle or whatever, is a sentence that says, surface must remain visibly wet for X number of minutes. Now, depending on the product and how strong it is, it could be three minutes, it could be five minutes, it could be 10 minutes, whatever it is. Right. But most, the way most people use a disinfectant is like this. That's not going to do jack. Yeah. What visibly wet means yeah. is like that. Okay. Listeningly wet. Yes. Okay. And that was alcohol, by the way. So it'll kill the germs on my hands. <laughs> so anyways, um, the problem is if I said to you, I want you to go out on the internet. I want you to research the best disinfectant that you can find. I don't care what it costs. I will pay for it. Right. And I want you to take it and I want you to use it in your studio, in, in your home, whatever. If you apply it according to the directions, mm -hmm. the best disinfectant in the world, how long will it kill germs for? An hour, a day, a week, or a month? Which one? An hour. Nope. Oh, really? Yeah. You got three other choices. So the best disinfectant, how long? The will best disinfectant in the world, chosen by. God, let's say, <laughs> just, just for, for a little fun there, okay? Mm -hmm. And you said, what, an hour? An, an uh, hour is wrong. Okay, and what was the other three choices? A month? Day, or week, or a month. The best disinfectant, maybe a week. It's a trick question. All the answers are wrong. Oh, really? As soon as it dries or evaporates. Remember how wet my hand looked? Yes. As soon as it dries or evaporates operates or is wiped up in most cases, it's gone. There's no wow. more killing after that. So yes, you may have cleaned the surface with like 409 or whatever. And yeah. Got it nice and, and you did get a lot of the germs off with that. Okay. Yeah. And then you sprayed the disinfectant and used it the right way. 
as soon as it's all gone through evaporation or drying, there is no more killing going on. Yes, the surface is clean. Yes, the surface is germ-free for the moment. But the first person to come by and touch or cough or sneeze on that surface has deposited microbes, which will start colonizing that surface. Oh, now, okay. Give an Makes sense. I went into a child care center not all that long ago. And I was trying to, to basically sell them my services, explain to them why it was important. And they thought it was important. And I told them I can take the same germ quantity meter or what's called uh, 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 an ATP meter mm -hmm. and swab the surfaces and be able to tell them within 15 seconds how biologically clean those surfaces are. Okay. Right. I said, pick a surface that you've recently cleaned. And they took me into the infant room. And they said, well, we just cleaned this whole changing table and disinfected it and everything and blah, blah, blah. Right. I, said, okay. I took the swab and I ran it around the top edge of the three side walls, right. rubbed it on the cushion that the child laid on and rubbed it on the little cabinet handles to get out the wipes and to get out a fresh diaper and all that stuff. Yeah. The meter will tell you the surface is biologically safe with a reading of 80, 80 or below. All right. Right. This one came up with a reading of 1,297. Wow. And this was minutes after they say they cleaned it and disinfected it. So then I said, let me show you something. I had a microfiber towel, the disinfectant-based cleaner that we used, sprayed right. it on, rubbed down those rail edges, rubbed down those handles, wiped down the cushion that the baby lays on, okay? Mm-hmm. And then I tested it again. The reading was under 30. Wow. That's impressive. And that's because, well, let me ask you a question. Do you clean your own home? I have people come in and help me. Okay. But have you ever cleaned your own home? Oh, of course. Yes. Okay. How did you learn? Maybe I'd by like watching mom? Watching mom. Yeah. All right. Do you have any brothers? No, only okay. child. Okay. Um, well, I'm sure you have male friends and they probably learned to shave the same way I did by watching my dad. Right. Now, learning to shave isn't quite as important in, in infection control as learning how to clean properly. Right. Okay? But believe it or not, there is a methodology to cleaning, which is almost a science to make it make sure that it's done right. But good quality cleaning or decontaminating, mm -hmm. a good broad spectrum disinfectant. And then an antimicrobial coating. And the beauty about the antimicrobial coating is that, especially the one we use, if you could see it on a microscopic level, it would look like little swords standing up on a surface like this. Right. So that when a cell comes down on that surface, it is impaled on the coating as if it fell down on swords. Right. And that coating has a charge to it, which as the cell that has landed on it comes down the shaft, the blade of the sword, hits this nitrogen atom and is electrocuted. So it keeps the survival rate of all kinds of cells, healthy cells, infected cells, all kinds of cells. It keeps that survival rate extremely low. Right. Now, we have tested surfaces that we have gone in and done the full service to and come back a month later when we, pre when we tested it before we did anything to it, the surface might be like the one I just told you about 1290 or whatever it was. Right. Okay. We come back 30, 60, 90 days later, we test that same surface. It's usually well below 60. Wow, that's very and, impressive. And that's all impressive. they really, what it does, it, it help this service not only seriously reduces the survival of, of infectious germs, yeah. okay, but it also makes it easier once we've been there and yeah. we've done our decontamination, our disinfection and our antimicrobial coating, it makes it exponentially easier for the people in that space to keep that space clean. Right. Because A, everything's been taken away by us. Yeah. Okay? The surfaces have been protected by us. And unless somebody like throws up or has a bloody nose or something like that all over a surface, yes. you really just need a, a, a spray bottle of a decent cleaner and a clean, and I prefer microfiber because it really picks up everything. Microfiber rag or towel, and it doesn't harm the coating and everything is hunky-dory. It stays low. There's very little colonization, if any, okay? And just to give you an idea 
of how easy it is for people to get sick in any environment. Right. All right. Um, if you take E. coli as an example, and there's E. coli everywhere, unfortunately. Right. But it only takes about 10 E. coli cells for you to get sick from E. coli. Yes. Okay. Now, how big is 10 E. coli cells? It's minuscule. Yeah. But the thing is this, if you were to take, you know, uh, a shirt pin from a shirt that you bought in the store, take the pin out and just scratch the surface of, let's say, a Formica table with it. Right. An inch long scratch. Okay? Right. And you took E. coli cells and you line them up end to end, not side by side, so you get a, but end to end along an inch, you get about 12,000 of them in. Okay. Wow. That's impressive. In, in, in an eighth of an inch, or no, maybe it's a 16th of an inch. Um, there are enough E. coli cells in that scratch in a 16th of an inch to potentially send 80 people to the hospital. Wow. They're small. Germs in general are small. And some of them are very deadly. Yeah. Okay. The, one of the problems we have in our society today is for, for hundreds of years, we've just accepted if you get a cold, you're going to have it for a week or two. Right. If you get, if you get the flu, you're going to be at, you're going to be out for a couple of days at least. Okay. If you get bronchitis, you're going to have to probably get an inhaler and stay home for a few days. Yeah. And it hasn't been until this pandemic has occurred that some people got their eyes opened to how easily we can get sick. Yeah. Or worse. Right. And I will tell you that even though I've been doing this business for just about 10 years now, nine plus years, um, until the pandemic came around, I would spend nine months a year trying to explain to people why we are not a cleaning company. We right. Don't know what they do. They don't do what we do, even if they say they do COVID-19 cleaning and disinfection. Right. The thing is that because we've taken such a lax approach over the decades and centuries, all right, mm -hmm. a, a lot of people were like, oh, it's just, it's just another flu. It's, you know, of course, it didn't help that there was a lot of political BS. Yeah. But that, that's a whole separate story. I would like to think that as a species, and not just here in the U.S., but globally, that we've had our eyes opened. Right. All right. Maybe a cold bucket of water poured down our back over this. Because yes. this is really serious stuff. It is. Now, I, I know that you mentioned you wanted to discuss the pandemic. So please, by all means, ask whatever questions you like. Well, yes, you know, in, in our society, there was a lot of controversy. People don't understand that, you know, um, you know, I'm not trying to share my opinion, but, you know, there was a lot of people saying one thing and there was a lot of people saying another thing. Some people said, you know, it's too soon. They didn't do enough of testing. You know, people were afraid they might get hurt. They, you know, that if they take the, you know, the vaccine, things might occur in the future, you know, and they might have, you know, medical problems because of the vaccine. But then, you know, technology has changed as well. And, you know, when we got the polio shot or we got, you know, shots when we were young children, they didn't have the technologies that we have now. They couldn't test it. So the, the, the testing period took a long time for them because they didn't have the technologies. This and, you know, when we do have vaccines, vaccines don't prevent us from getting it. They lower the chances and they also lower the chances of us becoming as ill as we would have got been if we weren't vaccined. And then people also thought that, oh, this, they thought that we were injecting, the vaccine was injecting the virus in us. And they didn't realize that it was not, it was a T protein in the virus that, you know, made us think that the virus was in us. And then it created, you know, a protection. And uh, so there was a lot of things. And then some, you know, the young kids, you know, on the internet, a lot of them were coming up to me and they're saying, well, I heard that it can make you infertile. I want to have children when I grow up. You know, a lot of the, the college kids and the teens, mm -hmm. you know, and they were afraid, you know, that it was going to make them infertile. So there was so many different things going on. And, and with a lot of the stuff on the internet, especially, and they didn't understand, you know, how important it was to get the vaccine and how it wasn't as dangerous as they thought. So what's your intake about what you thought about the, the vaccine and the importance or not importance of getting okay. the vaccine? Well, first of all, this wasn't just an outbreak of some little thing in one little state somewhere in the Midwest. 
this became a global health emergency. Yes. Okay? It was a global health emergency. And the, the, the one thing you absolutely should not inject into a conversation about a global health emergency that has proved its, its existence by appearing in every country around the globe. Right. The one thing you do not inject to that, into that discussion in any way, shape, or form is politics. Yes. And unfortunately, when this started to happen, or when we first started to notice it in the end of February, beginning of March of 2020, okay, the previous administration was like, oh, don't worry, it's no big deal, it'll be gone in a couple couple of weeks it's like the flu you you may not even know you have it and all that and the problem was the doctors were not allowed to talk at first it was yeah. just the head of the administration right right and the thing is that is where all the political bs was put into this as well as when you go on the internet and people who think they know what they're talking about right saying, oh, no, the government's using it to inject trackers into us to know where we are at all times. Excuse me, you've done that for years by talking on your cell phone. Exactly. They know where you are. They know what you're eating. They know who you're talking to. They know if you're saying bad things about other people. OK, so injecting trackers into us was total BS. And it, and it, and it there were other things, like you said, oh, it'll cause infertility. Oh, what do we know about, you know, are we going to grow two heads 10 years from now? <laughs> the, the volume of ridiculousness over this, just, I just wanted to throw up every day. I was like, how can people believe this stuff? Right. Come on. All right. I can understand anti-vaxxers. They have their beliefs about things. That's all well and good. And Okay. But you know what? If you're going to participate in society, however that be, by sending your children to school, by going to school or work yourself or by, by going out to the movies or whatever, okay? This isn't just about you. It's right. about you. It's about your children, your parents, your aunts, your uncles, your next door neighbors, your friends, your enemies, you know, your colleagues at work, all right? And, and in the beginning, and I, I believe that this was the case in the beginning when they said, no, don't, don't use, you don't have to, everybody doesn't have to use masks. I feel that that was for two potential reasons. A, they wanted to make sure that the healthcare givers, the doctors, the nurses, the ambulance crews, all of them right. had enough personal protection equipment, all right, to be able to keep themselves safe so that they could treat all of us. Right. Okay. The other reason is, I, I think that because nobody alive today, no medical doctor who's, who's 85 years old or older, okay, has ever seen a pandemic before. Right. The last one was a little over 100 years ago from today. Yes. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that they did do was they realized that trying to filter out what other people are exhaling. Right. Probably one of the best ways to keep from getting sick. Now, did it take us time? Did it take the medical professionals time to say, hey, wait a minute, don't just tie a bandana across your face. That's not going to filter jack. Yeah. Okay. You need to use an N95 or a P100. 100%. Filtered mask. All right. And also do not use the masks that allow you to have your exhale come out through a little vent. Right. Because then, yes, you're sort of protecting yourself by what you're not breathing from other people around you. But if you've got it somewhere else, like at home, mm -hmm. and you come to work and you're wearing one of these painter's masks, like that are, are N95s, they have like a little plastic valve right in front. So when you yes. exhale, it doesn't come up through here and fog your glasses. Right. Okay? So they said it's most important to wear a multi layered N95 or P100 mask to really, because if it, it Every disease, every infection has what they call a gestation period. That means the time between when you get it to when it fills into your system to when you are able to spread it. Right, right, and, right. And the gestation period is important because for a period of time, right in the beginning, you don't know you have it. You yeah. don't know you're sick with it and you don't know that you can spread it. So the fact that people say, oh, it's a waste of time to wear masks and all this and all that. That is people who don't either have, have an understanding or have the ability to understand or just don't care about the truth. Right. 
I mean, I have very close friends of mine and even a couple of family members who were like, oh, this is all crap. It's, it's you know, you know, nobody has really died from it. And the thing is, very few people in the way I understand this, and there are other professionals that would probably challenge me on this. But in essence, when you, when you go around and you don't know that you're spreading an infection, not only are you doing a disservice to yourself, but you're doing a disservice to everybody else around you. Right. Okay? And, and the need to wear an eye covering, wear a mouth and nose covering, um, wear gloves. I mean, in the beginning of the pandemic, okay, I didn't leave my home without surgical gloves on. Right. And a respirator on mm-hmm. and snug fitting eyewear on. Okay. Right. Um, I, you know, I remember people complaining about, oh, well, you can go to Walmart, but you can't go to church. Why can't we go to church? Their government's trying to control us, you know, and no, 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 don't be silly. The co- just like the flu in the winter. Right. Most people are inside in the winter. Yeah. More people are breathing each other's exhale right. in a closed environment. You're talking about a lot more germs in a tighter, non-aerated or air circulated environment. 100%. And, yeah. Right. And that's why they said, okay, let's do the outdoor dining thing. And some people still didn't go out to eat, which is fine. Everybody has to judge what's right for them. Yeah. But at the very least, they should follow the general precautions and guidelines of right. being intelligent about having to be in an environment like that. Yes. So the thing is, do we really know what the, what the vaccines will do to us in 10, 20, 30, 40 years? No, we don't. We right. do know from the history of vaccines that yes, there are people who either A, they don't really do much for, or people who have nasty adverse reactions to them. Oh, and I wanted to fit this in before the next thing. You were yeah. right. They don't actually inject you with the virus. Exactly. But they inject you with something that lets your immune system see that this is something we should probably attack. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm sure you remember when you were a child and you went to grade school and you went to the library, they showed you this really cool thing called the card catalog. Mm-hmm. Yes, All right. I remember. I, I think the only place one of those exists anymore is in the Smithsonian Institute. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't you know, doubt now, now we got these things with keys on them and these little rats running around the table. But <laughs> anyway, so my point is your immune system, one of the simpler ways to think about how your immune system works is each time your body encounters something that doesn't belong in it, your immune system, in essence, watches it. Right. And says, is this a good or a bad thing? Right. And then once it determines it's a bad thing, you usually get a fever. Mm -hmm. And that's the body's attempt at raising the temperature to burn out this invading pathogen. Right. right, These invading cells. All right. The other thing it does is it causes you to uh, ramp up your white cells because those are what also fight infection. Right. So now the body has, the immune system has seen this thing, has decided this is something we need to attack and eradicate, and and your body does those things. But your immune system also remembers. So the next time it comes into contact with something that probably looks like whatever that was, boom, it doesn't wait nearly as long to trigger the temperature and trigger the the white cells. Right, Uh, right. It knows, uh uh-oh, I remember this. This was not a fun time. Yes. We have to attack this and eradicate it. Okay. Yes. So yes, it's important to realize how your immune system works. Mm-hmm. It'd be nice if it worked that way for cancer, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Right. So what is the next thing you'd like me to comment on either about the pandemic or about what we do? Well, I'd like you to start telling people exactly what you do and how it actually can help people because, you know, as you've concluded that, you know, how severe germs could be and what they could do to the body, you know, they could destroy us, they could kill us, it can put us in the hospital, it can make us very ill, it can change the whole composition of your insides where your body won't function the same anymore because of germs. Right. And, And just for a moment, going back to the whole COVID issue, okay. Uh, as people would say, oh, nobody really died from COVID. Well, in a majority of the cases, people who had underlying health conditions, had heart issues, had kidney issues, had whatever. The problem with COVID was COVID 
exacerbated those problems, yes. made them exponentially worse. Yes. So they died in most cases from the issues they already had that were kind of like turbocharged and advanced. Yes. Because the COVID really hampered your system from being able to do anything. Yes. And so if you had, you know, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, a heart problem, uh, any type of heart problem. You had a heart problem or whatever problem, you know, it would just make it worse. It would make the inflammation of the tissue worse. It would yes. make that worse. You know, it would cause your kidneys to maybe shut down because you had kidney issues. And once your systems start to fail, all right, kind of like dominoes falling. Right. It doesn't matter till, the, till that energy, which caused the first domino to fall over, gets to the last domino and they're all down and done. Okay. Yeah. So now what we do that helps. So as I said earlier, we go into a facility and we go after all the surfaces, all the furniture, all the fixtures, the equipment in cases of child care centers or schools, the toys. Okay. Yes. We, I, I have a team. We roll up. We have a mobile decontamination lab that we bring on site with us. Mm -hmm. So in the case of, say, a child care center, in each room, all the toys are taken out and run through this decontamination lab. Okay. Mm -hmm. All the large plastic items like plastic chairs or like the little types kitchen sets or the vanity or the little black and decker you know workbench that the kids play with or the right. box car, all that stuff yeah comes yeah. out and gets decontaminated the larger plastic items like the chairs and the little type stuff that all gets pressure washed with a very strong disinfectant based detergent right i have an interior crew that goes in every doorknob and 18 inches around it, every light switch and 18 inches around it, every stairway railing, every faucet handle assembly and, and, and sink counter, every check-in counter, every table underneath the table, especially in childcare, they hide little yes. presents under there and under the edges of the chairs, okay? The cabinets that things are stored in all get cleaned out, all get decontaminated and disinfected. After all the toys and chairs are done and brought, dried off and brought back in, then we go room to room with a specialized electrostatic spray system to apply the antimicrobial in a flooding dose. Right. Make, that kind of goes back to that, you know, visibly wet thing I did with my hands. Yes. Okay. Um, some, some people may say you don't need to put that much down, but it dries quickly anyway. Nobody's there when we're working. And so then all of these surfaces, all of these toys, all of this furniture, all the light switches and doorknobs are protected against every time somebody touches them with one of these. Right. Okay. Now, here's how we know we do really well at what we do. I have a number of clients who have reported between a 50% and 70% reduction in infections year over year. That's excellent. Because our service is a once a year service. There are other companies that do something kind of sort of similar with a different product. And they say, um, you know, it's good for 90 days. The thing is, that gets expensive to yes. the person receiving the service. Mm -hmm. I got my training. I got my education in this through um, reading everything I could get my hands on from the CDC, the NIH, the WHO, okay? I've taken courses and gotten certified as an infection control technician. Um, I've taken a course on public infection prevention services, all right, and gotten my accreditation in there. Um, and it was very hard to do, believe it or not, because prior to the pandemic, there was very limited education on infection prevention and control, unless you were an OR nurse and you went to take these courses either at hospitals or there's, a, there's an association called APIC, which mm -hmm. stands for the Association of Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. And, but that's a much higher medical level education. You, you know, you, you've, you've got to know a lot more science to it. Right. But there is a company out there that does courses like this that offers them for hospital personnel, for like surgical center or personnel, doctor's office personnel, Okay, and interestingly enough, because New York State requires you, if you work in a child care center, whether you're the owner, the director, a teacher, an aide, or the person who, who mops the floor at night, right. you must have a minimum 
um, course requirement of infection control for child care centers. New York's the only state I know who requires it. I've heard there are other states. I know New Jersey does not, but they may be adopting it soon. Okay. And that's important because let's face it. Like I said to you earlier about how did you learn to clean by watching your mother and maybe why, by watching whoever she brought in. Okay. Right. You know, you didn't learn from a pro, so to speak, or cert a, cert a certific certificate holding pro. Right. I have taken a lot of these types of courses. I got my accreditation uh, for infection control technician in 2015 when the, when the course uh, I found out about it for the first time. Since mm -hmm. then, I've taken numerous courses. Actually, you can see some of my accreditations up here. Right. And, uh, there's even a few more. <laughs> so um, I believe that edu getting educated in what you do is very important. So much 100%. so that out of my 19 member crew that I have, and I've had them for the last nine years, I don't think they'd leave if I fired them. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I take good care of my people. Um, I have required, once I took these courses and, and believed that they would teach good stuff and the right. accreditations were worth it, I told my staff, all of you need to take this course and get this accreditation or you can't work for me anymore. Right. And I'm going to make it easy because I'll pay for you to take the course. Right. So some of my people have just the basic infection control uh, technician certification. Some of them have the public infection prevention certification. Um, and as far as I know, there are no other companies that I know of that offer what I offer and the extent to the way we offer it. Right. And I mean, I don't know of any, let's say, even a cleaning company that has people that are professionally trained and accredited in cleaning and decontamination. Right. But it was interesting. I thought I knew what I was doing when it came to cleaning and decontamination. And when I took a course three years ago on it, uh, it was amazing how much I, you know, it, it's funny because a lot of times the difference between doing an okay job and doing a stellar job is just tweaking your technique a little bit. Yes. Like a lot of people will spray cleaner on a surface and take a towel and, you know, yeah. rub it in circles. Right. Think of taking five different colors of finger paint jars and dipping your fingers in them. So you have a little different color on each finger. Right. Putting it on a piece of paper and going like this with it. Right. You're going to create rainbows of color mixing over. Right. Think of each one of those colors as a different germ. Mm. Now, when you take something like a microfiber towel, which even dry picks up an incredible amount of stuff. Right. But when you take one of those and instead of just going like this with it, you do what's called a leading edge wiping or leading edge cleaning, where you spray the surface down completely and get it soaking wet. And you take the towel and you go like this. And the same edge is always in the forward position. Okay. Yeah. That picks up 10 times the amount, if not more than this. Really? This, yes. You're just pushing it around the surface because when you do it by leading edge cleaning like this, yes. whatever gets trapped under the leading edge, mm -hmm. as, as the bulk of debris kept, you know, fills that edge, it starts to push it up where there's fresh towel. And push it up where there's fresh towel and push it up where there's fun. so you're constantly you can you you can wipe down a whole table very easily right and the way i the way i've trained my people to do it is first go this way all right and then go this way oh. so that you get as much of it as possible right and right and go around the edges in okay. one direction and that's how you will do the best job of cleaning or decontaminating a surface right. it also helps if you use a good quality cleaner now in childcare, they use for, because it's cheap, they use two ounces of bleach to a quart of water in a sprayer as disinfectant. Yeah, I see that all the time. But what a lot of these places do is, okay, a kid will sneeze, all right? They'll take the bleaching water, spray it on the table, wipe it up and spray it again. Right. Okay. The thing is, yes, that bleaching water will disinfect and kill a lot of the germs that, that the rag picks up. Yeah. But if there's any kind of, you know, uh, saliva or, or hand lotion or sweat that's dripped onto a surface, yeah. right, you need a cleaner to yes. properly remove that. And yes. when people play, I walk in there like, oh, no, we don't need the surface like yours. We clean 20 times a day with bleach. And I'm like, no, you don't. 
No, oh, no, really, we do. We clean at least 20 times a day with bleach. I said, you don't clean once a day with bleach. They're like, you've never been here before. How can you say that to us? I said, real, real simple. Bleach is used for two things primarily, okay? Whiten your husband's underwear and <laughs> as a disinfectant on surfaces. But as a disinfectant on surfaces, it's used horribly incorrectly most of the time. Now, as part of my history, I'm the son of a dermatologist, the skin doctor. Okay. And before my father passed in the end of 2015, I had started doing this in 2013. I said to him, Dad, I remember you showing me something about bleach and what it does to the skin. I said, they're using this stuff in child care centers. I said, how dangerous is it? He goes, well, I'm sure they're using it watered down. He goes, but just the same. He goes, even if you put one drop of bleach in a cup of water, one drop out of an eyedropper, Okay. It's probably more than enough that if you accidentally drink it, you'll wind up puking all over the place. Wow. So there was a situation in a child care center. I believe it was in Jersey City, New Jersey, back in 2015, where they hired a new assistant for one of the teachers in one of the rooms. Right. This person came in on, their day, on the day they started and mid morning, the teacher says, listen, go into the kitchen and take a tray and put some paper cups on it and grab a gallon of water and fill the cups, and then bring it out. I'm going to get the cookies ready. So the assistant went and did that, and the teacher's handing out the cookies around the different tables, and the, the assistant's handing out the water. And the teacher says, okay, let's enjoy snack. Within minutes, there were kids puking all over the place. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Because a lot of these schools will take a gallon of water, and they will put the right amount of bleach into it according to state regulations to make mm -hmm. it disinfectant. But you have to remember to label it. Do not drink <gasps> contains bleach for disinfection. Oh, my gosh. The person who mixed it, which was not the new assistant that was hired, but the person who mixed it forgot to mark it and left it on top of the fridge with other jugs of, of you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, oh, my God. You know, water. Yes, and, yes, and yes. Like and um, so the problem was, they took 27 people to the hospital in Jersey City that day. Wow. And um, as far as I remember reading, the next day the state closed it permanently. Because it's, it's I mean, it's you're poisoning kids. Not that yeah. what they consumed probably, because most of them consumed a, a couple of sips. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't enough to kill it. I mean, it could have, maybe. But it didn't kill anybody. But it even made like seven of the teachers violently ill. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, I'm sure by the next morning, most of those kids' parents canceled their, their contracts and everything, but the state shut them down. Mm -hmm. And it's really important. And well, that's a serious mistake. Oh, my goodness. And the other thing that's a real problem with stuff like that is that just like any other disinfectant, surface must remain visibly wet. And the problem with that in a child care center is if, you know, if you have kids come by and they put their, they see the table shiny, they put their hand on it. And they put it on their hand. Yeah, they're going to they get it in their eyes or in their nose. I do a presentation where I have a picture of, of oral mucosa burns from bleach. Oh. It looks like some kid was sucking on a soldering iron. The oh, my the mouth, gosh. The inside of the gums have all of this, like, bright orangish or brownish staining from where the bleach burnt the skin. Oh my goodness. Yes. And that's why when I walk into a child care center, I say, you don't want to use that crap anymore. No, not no. at all. You, yeah. You, whatever you buy, don't buy something with bleach in it. What would you and, suggest people buy? Like if, if people are cleaning their homes or their, their facilities or their businesses, you know, and they don't have you yet to come in their facility to to degerminize the the area and to and kill the 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 germs what's the best products you suggest that actually do a good job or a, uh, or a cluster well, the, the three things that in my opinion will do the best job short of of hiring us is buy good quality cleaning products you know a, a 409 or or or, you know, any of those good brands of cleaning products, you know, yes. pine saw is very good when used properly. Yes. Right. Then get a good quality disinfectant, preferably one that does not have much of a scent 
because if it doesn't have much of a scent, it won't have much of a taste if it accidentally gets in somebody's mouth. Right. All right. And use it according to the directions. Now, that means keeping the surface visibly wet with that disinfectant for however many minutes the product tells you to leave it on. That's where they get their 99% or 99.9 or 99.99% kill claim from. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then if you can find a good quality, non-leaching antimicrobial to put on your surfaces, and I'll tell you what that means in a moment, mm -hmm. um, I would use that as well. Okay. And there, there are multiple different brands out there. Yes, you'll have to do a little reading on the internet to learn. Mm -hmm. Do not click on the ads. Go to the ones that are evidently researched from different you know, major corporations or, or health concerns or health departments. Right. Um, the CDC website has what they call list N for oh, disinfectants yeah. that are effective against pretty much everything, including COVID. Okay. And I would recommend you go to the CDC website and look at list N and it will give you products that they say, yes, this'll kill it. This'll kill it. This'll kill it. This'll kill it. If it's not on that list, I wouldn't use it. I heard okay. Pine Sol is supposed to be very good with COVID. Is that true? To be honest with you, we don't use Pine Sol because I consider consider that more of a what they call an OTC over the counter or or homeowner grade product. Right, right. Um, in in my research of what I've done, uh, as far as a disinfectant, and and one of the ones I really like is a hydrogen peroxide based product. Okay. okay. And the reason I like a hydrogen based pro hydrogen peroxide based product is because when hydrogen peroxide dries or evaporates, however you want to look at it, it breaks down into two things that will not harm us: oxygen and water. Okay. Okay. I know that. Whereas when you use other types of disinfectants, including some of the popular brands, and I'm not going to mention them because I don't want to get sued. <laughs> okay. but a lot of them will leave a residue after they dry yes and i'll give you a perfect yeah. example i was in another child care center on saturday doing a job and i noticed that like on their um what do you call it? lego and duplo blocks and some of their like toy toy trucks and stuff like that there was this white residue on them and i know what that is now because from years of seeing it it's bleach and water residue right all right. So, you know, kid puts that in their mouth. Maybe it might make them sick. Maybe it won't. I don't know. I don't, I, I've, I've never asked my grandchildren to test for me. Right. So um, I would say do not use bleach and water unless you're using it in the laundry, okay, mm -hmm. which is where it was designed for. Um, I would get a good quality cleaning solution. I would get a good quality disinfectant. And if you're up for it, uh, an antimicrobial. Oh, and I started to tell you not a leaching antimicrobial. So there are two basic different types of antimicrobials, leaching okay. and non-leaching. Leaching means when you spray it on a surface and it dries, it's on that surface. But microbes need to consume it, meaning ingest it, and it's a poison and it kills the microbes. Right. Okay. The other problem with it is if you put your hand on that surface, because it is, it's leaching because it will not stay on the surface. Oh, it'll come up on your fingers, it'll, it'll come off on your clothes. Okay. Yes. If you have an infant child and they're, you know, putting their open mouth down on the table. Right. You know, because the, the antimicrobial that we use is non leaching, meaning when we apply it to a surface, the chemical nature of it bonds to the clean virgin material of the surface. With, if you remember your high school chemistry, something called a covalent bond. Right. Which means it, in essence, becomes one with the surface and only comes off through long term friction abrasion, hands rubbing on it, plates rubbing on it, whatever rubbing on it. Right. Normally, you cannot take it off with a cleaner unless you use something like soft scrub and a scrubby pad. Mm -hmm. And then you'll usually take whatever the finished surface is off anyway. Right. So you don't use that. Okay. Um, you can pour straight bleach on the coating we use, won't touch it, okay? You use 409, Windex, whatever you want, won't touch it, okay? Right. But it is critically important when you're using a non-leaching antimicrobial to keep those surfaces clean because if you, you've knocked over a glass of milk or knocked over juice or somebody had an explosive sneeze on a surface and you just wipe it up, 
okay? Then what happens is you've got something, if you don't clean the surface really well, there's a film that dries. Have you ever noticed when you clean a table or something and you come back in the room a little later and the sun's hitting the table at a certain angle, you can you see, see the, the white film. marks. Yes. Yeah, that in most cases, that's what's called biofilm, all right? And it means it has cells in it that are dry on that surface or maybe not really dry because cells to replicate need a friendly surface, moisture, warmth, and a food source, kind of <laughs> like us, right? We survive. Okay. okay. So by disinfecting the, sur the surface and by putting the antimicrobial on, after you've wiped up whatever is there and preferably wiped it up with a little cleaner of some kind, yeah. anything that's left behind is most likely eradicated by the coating. Okay. All right. And, that, and, and it, will, it will damage any cell so that it cannot replicate. Okay. okay. Now, if it is a virus infected cell. Let's here's something to remember about viruses. Viruses do not replicate on their own. Mm -hmm. Viruses must get into some other cell that has the ability to replicate. Okay. Remember I said every 20 minutes, pop. Yep. Okay. So that happens with bacteria cells and other cells all the time. S different cells replicate at different rates, time rates. But if, if something gets infected with a virus, or if, or if a cell gets, um, what's the word, I'm invaded by a virus, mm -hmm. that virus is now going to make itself part of that cell so that when that cell replicates and copies itself right. apart, it's taken a piece of the virus coding with it. Okay. The code that creates the virus. Therefore, now instead of it just being a bacterial cell or some other cell, it's now a viral cell. Gotcha. A virus on its own can't replicate in, in okay. as many cases as I have ever heard of. All right. right. So mm -hmm. in that respect, yes, if the virus is in a cell and if you kill the cell, all right, and clean the surface routinely, you won't be allowing a virus to have a whole host of hosts, meaning other cells, right. to replicate with. Gotcha. All right. So basically when we get done, with what we do, you know, it, like I said, it's a once a year service. And when you use the service, uh, you'll see a reduction in infection issues, especially with a high volume location, like a childcare center. Right. And our clients love the service. I have people who have been renewing year after year for not almost 10 years now. All right. Um, not everybody renews. Okay. Some people you know, they do it once they figure, okay, look, we, we opened X number of years ago. We had these guys come in, they did their thing. We're good for a while. That's what you call wishful thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes. Are you much safer than you were before we showed up and did what we did? Absolutely. Right. But the thing is, our specialty is infection, prevention, control, and eradication. Right. Now, can we help with airborne infections? Yes, we can, but that requires a, a different situation altogether. That's not so much a service as it is a piece of equipment you need to buy and put in a room that uses ultraviolet wavelength C light to suck all the room air through it. And the special light in there shatters the DNA in cells. So they, okay. you know, it's, it's like hitting a mouse with a double barrel shotgun. There's not right. much use left. Okay. But no, when, when, when we do our service, we can't always prevent an airborne infection from happening. Right. And sometimes, you know, like I said, with the gestation period, all right, I had a client who we did on, we did their job on a Saturday and on um, Tuesday, she calls me, she goes, I'm stopping payment on my check. I said, why? She goes, I have a half a dozen kids with pink eye. Obviously your stuff doesn't work. And I said, hold on. First of all, and I happen to know this at that point in time, pink eye has a gestation period of between, I believe it's five and nine days, depending. Right. Okay. We did your place on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Yes. They had to get this at, at the latest last Friday before we came in to do the service. Right. So please realize it has nothing to do with what we did. Yes. Okay. And please don't, can't, and she was fine. She was like, fine, uh, let me look that up. If what you say is the same as what I look up, you're good. And we were good. Right. Okay. But 
We also offer a service called urgent response disinfection. It's basically emergency disinfection service for when a client has an outbreak of some kind. Yes. And normally we charge 350 per room per visit to do that when it's needed. But if you're a client with your one-year contract, you get four of those at no additional charge to the initial service. So if, if, you know, if at the end of a certain day after we've done the service, a week, a month, three months later, whatever it be, uh, all of a sudden you notice you've got six kids out in room four that all have the flu. Mm -hmm. You call me up and you say, hey, Erwin, I've got six kids out in room four with the flu. I need to have you come in and do your, your disinfection thing. Yeah. We will come in that day at the end of business and we tell them exactly how to prep the room. We come in, we flood that room with terminal disinfectant that pretty much kills anything. Right. And an hour after we're gone, it's dissipated and it's ready for use the next morning. And they get four of those. We also do, we enforce our own warranty. I don't know how many companies go out of their way to enforce their own warranty, but the way we do it is at least three to five times a year, except through the pandemic, because you weren't allowed to go in anywhere. Right. Um, we would come back. I would go back uh, at random times of the day to different clients' places and test with the germ meter. Right. And if any room got a failing reading three times in a row, I would tell them, I need to do a warranty respray on this room. In nine plus years, I've never had to do warranty respray. Wow, that's very impressive. You know, I, I just, I am so happy that I work with the companies I work with to get the products that I get from them to use in our business. Right. Um, interestingly enough, the antimicrobial that we use was developed by a company. Uh, I'm not sure if you're of, I don't think you're of the same vintage that I am, but there was a company called Dow Corning many years ago. Dow Corning. Which is oh, now no. Dow Chemical and Corning Optics. Okay. They were both together. They, they're from New York State. And they developed the product we used 54 years ago. Now, wow. you remember when the pandemic first started and New York City, the military came in and put those blow up military hospitals in Central Park. Yes, I remember. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they used the Javits Convention Center as another facility. Yes. So they would clean those. They, they, the, the, the tents that they used are always put away clean and disinfected, but they would blow them up. Right. They would roll in all of the sanitized and disinfected equipment, take the plastic wrapping off of it, put it in place. All right. Then somebody would come in with a backpack sprayer with the same exact product we use and flood the place, all the equipment, the beds, the operating rooms, everything with the antimicrobial coating before they let one person in without a hazmat suit on. Because that way they knew it was an environment that could keep itself right. as safe as possible from microbial colonization all over yes. the places. So it's, it's amazing that it, it, it does what it does. I mean, companies like Nike and Under Armour and Reebok and all that, all those sports equipment and yes. clothing companies use this product in the manufacturing of their raw materials to weave their shirts and their shorts and, and, and to injection mold their sneakers and, and to make their laces and all that. You know, if you look at, if you look at those kinds of products, it'll say, you know, uh, can with uh, micro, the antimicrobial coating can withstand X number of wash cycles. Right. I mean, eventually you do wash it. Mm -hmm. But that this is the type of thing that companies are starting to use in the manufacturing of clothing products to help keep the <sighs> frequency of infection as low as possible. You know, I, I hear sometimes people say, and it drives me nuts, but they say, well, you know, we don't have to worry so much about little kids because little kids have good immune systems. And they were doing that even with COVID too. They were saying, you know, we don't have to get the shot because, you know, little kids, you know, you know, they, their immune systems are, are really good. But then you see these kids getting sick and they're, they're spreading the illness so quickly to one another. And then the adults are getting it very quickly as well. So this arc represents the human immune system from birth to death. So if there's different levels of how strong it is from birth, your immune system is learning about infections and how to deal with them. In your middle years, it's learned pretty much everything it needs to know, except for new things like COVID and stuff like that. All right. And as you get older, your immune system starts to wear out just like the rest of your body. 
Right. So to say children are so young children are immune to it was probably initially mentioned because they didn't really know. Yes. Including the medical community. Right. Okay. But in general, the medical community knew young children don't have much of an immune system yet. Yes, if they breastfed or if they got certain types of formula, yeah, they probably got certain things that helped get their, give, the, give their immune system a leg up, especially breast milk, mm -hmm. um, unless unfortunately the child is allergic to it. But the thing being that to say, oh, well, we don't have to worry about children because they're, they're not going to get it. That was just foolish to say that. Yeah. You have to always approach any type of a biological threat with mm -hmm. the utmost personal security so that you don't acquire it. And if God forbid you do, you minimize how far you can spread it. And one of the things I used to say to people when they say, oh, my bandana is good enough. <laughs> be like, let me, let me show you why your bandana is not good enough. Yeah. All right. And I, I, you know, I'd say, take a cigarette, light it, put your mask on and exhale or put your bandana on and exhale. And yeah. you see the cloud come out from underneath and you see the cloud come right out through the fabric. Right. Okay. And that's why they were talking about which masks are better than others because some have the triple layer filtration in them so that, you know, even the smallest of, of, of pathogen, you know, even the mist from your snow, your nose can't get out of it. Right. Okay. Um, and, and even infections, speaking of the mist from your nose, even infections that are mostly airborne. Okay. Um, gravity affects everything. Mm -hmm. So yes, when you cough or sneeze and you have something large enough to see it, that it's visible when it came out, right. that's going to hit a table relatively quickly because it has mass to it and gravity does its thing. But you can have a sneeze where the microbes remain in the air for hours because right. they're, they're microscopically small and they get carried on the breeze. Eventually, they all hit the ground or hit a table or whatever. Right. But when people say, oh, well, we don't need a service like yours because the big thing now is all airborne. No, it's not all airborne. Right. All right. And if a kid sneezes, ah, shoot, like that. Yeah. It's all over that table. Right. You know, so you, you get, it's just, it's common sense. And like I said, you know, can, can, can people get horribly ill or die from new vaccines? Absolutely. It does happen. Okay. But remember, we're trying to do what's good for the masses, to protect the masses. And unfortunately, sometimes people develop sensitivities to medications. I mean, look at all the drugs that are marketed on television. Yeah. And they'll yeah. tell you, oh, and don't use if you were allergic to the product or any of the ingredients in the product. Right. Okay. Um, I remember, as a woman, I'm sure you've heard of the term in cosmetics, especially of hypoallergenic. Yes. Mm -hmm. I remember when that first that term first came on the scene and I was we were sitting at dinner one time at home and I said, dad, does hypoallergenic really mean that nobody will have a reaction to it? He goes, no, what it means is it's, it's actually been formulated to a point where a minimum number of people have any kind of reaction to it. Mm -hmm. Some may still have a, a strong reaction or severe reaction, but most people, if they have anything, it'll it'll be minimal if even noticing right but so so hypoallergenic is a very misleading term yes you just have to be smart about it you know look we're going into winter and people think oh we're going into cold and flu season realistically cold and flu season is 12 months a year yes it's okay? true some people mm -hmm. oh i got the summer flu it's not the summer it's flu <laughs> okay? it's real simple it's flu but the yes. reason we normally think of cold and flu season being in the late fall to early spring, especially with the winter, with people being inside, being so close to each other. And one person, you know, one person goes to the arcade and touches all the buttons and puts their fingers in their mouth and they come home and two days later they have God knows what, and they're spreading it to their family and they're spreading it to their, their fellow students because, you know, it's December out, everybody's freezing their tail off and everybody's playing games inside on the classroom floor. Right. So it's real simple if either COVID or something else or, or flu and cold um, start to rear their ugly heads, some of the things we learned in the pandemic apply 
to the most minuscule type of infection. Okay. Keep your distance. Wash your hands like a lunatic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Use soap. Right. Sing the ABCs twice. Okay. Yes. And and rinse them well and dry them well. As a matter of fact, speaking of hand washing, I provide a free course to my clients every year, once a year, on proper hand washing technique. And it's a compilation of how surgeons prepare their hands for surgery because they don't want to transmit anything or, right. you know, anybody. So we go in, we teach that, and we teach it with a special solution. Uh, it's called glow germ. And, and what that means is it's, it's you, you remember as a kid, you had uh, maybe some, uh, some of those posters that you put a black light on in your room and they'd have the day glow colors on. Them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this stuff creates like a, a green color, but you can't see it in regular light, only in black light. So what I do is I take a couple of toys and I spray them with the stuff, I let it dry. I put them on the table, I have the teachers come in and I have them pass the toys around. And then I say, okay, I turn the light, the little black light on and I go around the room and I show them, they all have these blotches of the screen. They're like, what is that? I said, those were the germs that were all over the toys and don't worry, they're not real germs. And so they're like, oh, wow. I said, so look, now we're going to do a different experiment. I take the liquid material and I squirt it in their hand, just like hand lotion. I have them rub it all around their hands and I turn the light on. They're like, ah, it's like they glow green in their hands. So I say, okay, now, before I show you any of the tricks, go in the, in the bathroom, wash your hands, dry your hands and come back out. And I usually send two or three of them in. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. come out and I put the light on their hands again and there's like 90% less of the glow germ on their hands, but oh, wow. it's, it's all in their nails, in the nail beds, in the knuckle wrinkles. Okay. Yes. Between the fingers. And a lot of it winds up up here. Oh, really? You can wash their hands and they're not going like this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Just don't forget a lot of times you're resting your hand on an, on the edge of a table or something. Yes. Okay. So then I show them two or three little moves that they don't need anything but soap to use, all right? Ha the different ways of moving your hands and this and that and the next thing and make sure you go up here. Right. Then I send them back to the bathroom, wash your hands again with what I just showed you and they come out and there's nothing left. And I give them, each of them, a certificate, which I am told, I have not checked with the state on this, but I am told are good for two credit hours per teacher for continuing ed credits in the state of New Jersey. Oh, wow. So that's yeah. very good. Yeah, so I... I believe in education. As a matter of fact, I even make the child care infection control technicians training course uh, available to my clients through the same company that I got it from. And, you know, like when you go to the salon or if a guy goes to the barber shop, you see you see the, the state license for that stylist on the yes. wall. Mm -hmm. So I tell them, I said, look, besides me giving you all the signage and all the brochures for being a healthy, a certified healthy child zone program protected school. If your teachers take this course and I'll get it for you at a discounted price, I said, now on one of your, you know, your, your cork boards near the entry, you put these all up and say, our teachers are certified in proper hand washing technique to be taught to your children, especially since this damn pandemic. Yes. If, if parents see that you're a certified healthy child zone program protected school, if they see that you're making sure your teachers are trained properly, if yeah, they're seeing true. that the teachers are training the students in proper hand washing technique, that means a lot to the parents. And I'll tell you a quick funny story, then I'll answer whatever other questions you want until time runs out, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, I have this school in Montclair, New Jersey um, called Over the Rainbow. And it's a, it's, it's a beautiful school. It's, it's on a small, well, not small, it's on a large piece of property. It's a giant old center hole colonial house. And uh, the woman who owns it is one of my first clients. And I remember I did the training course for them a couple of years ago. And now we've been doing it every year. But back then, some mother brought her child one morning and said, listen, we're going away for the weekend. So I'm going to pick up little Johnny or Betty or whatever the kid's name was. I'm going to pick them up around noon. Okay, fine. No problem. Mother shows up. The owner of the school is right there, lets her in. Oh, let me go get little Johnny. He's out in the playground. She brings little Johnny in. She brings mm -hmm. him into the bathroom, puts him up on her knee so he can wash his hands. And he's, you know, he's washing his hands the way I trained the teacher to train them. Right. And after like 30 seconds, 
the, the owner of the school goes, come on, Johnny, mommy's waiting. You're, you know, dry your hands. And he turns to her and goes, Miss Lorraine, please don't rush me. I have to wash my hands properly. Oh. And the mother goes, what's all that about? And <laughs> she told her and she goes, I am so happy my son goes here. Yeah. So well, that's very it, refreshing. It, it, you know, education is critically important about everything in life today. Yes, it is. About what to consider real information and what to consider high in the sky craziness. Yes. Okay. How to take care of yourself properly. Yeah. How to be decent to people properly. Yes. And uh, how it's important to go to work and make a living so you can afford the life you want properly. Right. Exactly. But when it comes back to what I do, what else can I share with you? No, I think we covered everything. You know, the only thing that came to my mind is what about monkeypox? That's a new virus that just came through and people don't know a lot about it, but it's very scary to many. And does your services do anything that helps prevent or lessen the chances? As you remember, there are a couple of things I've said during our talk. First of all, you get sick most of the time by touching contaminated surfaces and touching yourself. Right. So monkeypox is um, a form of the chicken pox virus. Yes. Okay. So our product, one of the products we use are um, effective against, I believe it's called uh, pox genus vaccinarus. If I remember that I'm pr pr pronouncing it correctly, I'm probably wrong. So if anybody's watching, just go look it up. <laughs> but anyway, um, monkeypox, the biggest thing, the biggest spread about monkeypox you're saying is through the homosexual community, mm -hmm. um, through, through sex and, and close bodily contact. Skin okay. skin con doesn't necessarily have to be intercourse, but all right. But what happens is that that infection creates these pustules all over the skin. Right. And Basically, just like a zit, if you pop it and you get the stuff from the zit on your finger and you touch a table, gotcha. or you get monkeypox and, and you, or you lean on something and one bursts and it weeps through your t-shirt onto a surface and somebody gets it yes. and they introduce it to their body, that's a problem. Our service, okay, the way we do it, we have been told will be effective against surface contamination spread of monkeypox. Gotcha. But it's the kind, it's like anything else. Okay. I mean, ever since the pandemic, the, the state department of uh, health and human services, uh, family services for child care centers has said, you must clean a surface or an object as soon as you see it's contaminated. Right. So if little Susie has an explosive sneeze on the table, you're to deal with it right now. Right. That means clean it very, very well, disinfect it very, very well. Okay. And take her and put her in another room where there you are, either no other children or other sick children. Okay. Right. The best thing to do is to send that child home. All right. But basically, um, if, if you go after whether it's whether it's a little bit of of pus or whatever you want to call it that comes out of a monkey pox pustule. All right. You know, gloves, absolutely gloves. Wipe it off, spray it with cleaner, wipe it off, spray it with cleaner, wipe it off, spray it with disinfectant and don't let anybody go near it till it's dry. And I have one more question before we you go. I have 10 more questions. <laughs> I'm really enjoying this. this okay. Okay. So I, you know, people, you know, cross contamination of food occurs all the time and I was a victim of it and I got neurovirus from it. Now, when people cook, you know, sometimes you're using the same utensils, you take the chicken out, you wash the chicken, but the, the chicken, the juices sometimes fall on the counter. People don't realize it or it's still on their hands. And, you know, <laughs> you know, you find people can get sick so easily, you know, um, even after they finished the meal and they cleaned everything up, you know, what's your suggestion to help people so they don't get sick and they don't get cross contamination or the next person comes in to make a meal, doesn't pick up any, any viruses or any germs or any, okay. you know, salmonella from the chicken so, and so forth. Chicken, beef, any raw 
food product, okay? Including vegetables. Okay. Vegetables, of course, first you, you wash and you dry. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you do, if, if, if you took whatever vegetables you're going to use for dinner out and put them in a bowl or put them on a plate so you had them right next to the sink to wear and you washed them, don't dry them and put them back on the same plate or in the same bowl. Okay. Because anything that was on them is on the surface of that material of that bowl. Okay. Gotcha. And all you're doing is recontaminating. Gotcha. Right. Um, when I first got into this business in 2013 and started to learn, and I learned, you know, I always knew that salmonella came from chicken. Right. But, you know, you see the chicken go and get cooked on the grill or cooked in the oven. You know, when it's cooked in the oven, it usually stays in the hot pan and is put on some trivets or something. But when you cook it on the grill, you know, you take it out there, you, you fork each piece off the plate onto the grill. And a lot of people fork each piece from the grill back onto the plate. Yes. And that's the recontamination happens. So after I learned about this, um, my, my significant other and I were cooking chicken one night for dinner. Mm -hmm. And I, she was actually cooking it. And I watched her and she knew what I did for a living at this point. <laughs> I, I watched her cook the chicken and put it back on the plate and bring it in. And she goes to put a piece on my plate and a piece on her plate. I said, wait a minute, let, let me see that. And I took the plate back outside and I put the sides of the chicken that had contacted the plate back on the grill, brought the plate in, rinsed it off, put it in the dishwasher, washed my hands, took two paper plates so they'd be a little stronger. Right. And when, in the time that it took me to do that and go back out there, I'm sure the open flame of the grill killed whatever was on the chicken. Yeah. And brought it back on essentially a sterile plate compared to one that had chicken drippings on it. Right. And she's like, what did you do that for? I said, because even though you rinsed the chicken off before you put it on the plate to take it to the grill, there were still plenty of salmonella cells potentially on that chicken, which right. were now on that plate, which even though you cooked the chicken to the right temperature and made sure it was safe, once you put it back on the plate, you laid it back into those juices, which very well may have had salmonella. Yeah. And that's how people get sick with salmonella. I mean, most people don't eat raw chicken. Right. It's not as far as I've seen. <laughs> whether it's that, whether it's hamburger, especially yeah. hamburger, hot dogs, steak, you know, veal, whatever. Make the, the plate that you bring it away from the cooking device, whether it be the oven or the grill. Yeah. Right? Make the plate that you use to put the cooked food on. Make sure it's a clean plate or a new disposable plate. Right. And, and there have been times, you know, where, um, where we've had like a big holiday dinner and I'll cook a variety of different meats and chicken and stuff like that. And, you know, I'll bring in the first batch. I don't cook all of it because, you know, you don't want to go to waste. Yeah. And what I'll do is I'll take the serving platter wash it down, spray it with some soap, wipe it down, rinse it off and dry it to go cook the next batch. Right. And bring it in on the clean um, platter rather than the other one. Because so many people, I don't think realize that sometimes they think, well, it wasn't cooked enough. It's not that. It could be just put back with a contaminated plate or a contaminated exactly. bowl. And exactly. that's the reason why they're getting sick. And, and just to give you an idea, if you took a little regular little eyedropper, okay, and you rinsed the chicken and you put it on a plate and it was going to be a few minutes before you were going to go cook it and the water and, and, and other material that's on that chicken gets on the plate. If you were to suck that up with just a regular eyedropper yeah. and put two or three drops on 10 people's tongues, you'd probably get easily seven of them sick. Right. So the problem is germs are too small to be seen. Germs are out of sight, out of mind. Yes. Okay? And, and just as people, we need to be significantly more cognizant yes. of what we're doing. Okay. I mean, not that I still do it to this day. I, I keep a, a nice size pump bottle of disinfectant in, in the door pocket of my car yeah. when I come out of a place, but I usually carry like the little tiny squeeze bottles in my pocket. Mm -hmm. So you know, if I go into a client's place and, you know, even if it's just a fist bump on the way out the door, it's squirt, yeah. you know, all of this. Or if I'm going, even if I'm going into a childcare center today, I will still wear surgical gloves. 
Now, one question, like when there was a lot of recalls when they had the um, sanitation um, lotions for your hands, a lot of them got recalled because everybody started making them because they wanted to make a fast buck, but it has to have certain ingredients, a certain amount of percentage of certain things in right. order for it to be effective. Can you tell the audience so what they need to A lot of the hand sanitizer, a lot of the hand sanitizers that were out there back in, I'm going to, I think it was 2017. The CDC, uh, or no, it was the EPA and the FDA, more the FDA, that banned numerous products out there that could no longer be sold because they included an a, 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 a ingredient called triclosan. Okay. okay. And a lot of these products were, were marketed as, you know, um, better than hand washing, kills germs instantly, kills everything, blah, blah, blah. And it turned out that Triclosan, even though it had been in products for decades, mm -hmm. turned out to not work really as great as or anywhere near what they claimed it did. Okay. So, so the FDA considered that a health hazard through false advertising. Mm -hmm. And then it therefore put out a list that said, you know, your products that have these in it, you have to reformulate them and you cannot sell them anymore effective Friday or whatever day. Right. Um, Child care centers, you know, it, it's not really a get rich quick business. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a real calling. Some people open child care centers just to build a business and make a living. Okay. Right. But a lot of these places are, are, they love the fact that places like Costco exist because they can go buy, you know, yeah. 20 packs of paper towels for less than you can buy them in the supermarket for. Right. You know, mm -hmm. or, 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 or instead of paying whatever bleach costs per gallon in the supermarket, they get it for two thirds of that price if they buy a three pack at Costco or whatever other warehouse. Yeah. All right. So they love those places. And a lot of them had, you know, cartons of hand sanitizer. Yes, they did. They couldn't use anymore. And they just had to basically throw them out. The other thing they had to throw out was a few years ago, the e EPA, I think it was, um, banned certain um, bleach, ma manufactured bleach products from China because they weren't nearly as pure as they were supposed to be. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And so the state of New Jersey, if I recall correctly, the state of New Jersey posted something that said, you are no longer allowed to use any Chinese made bleach. Wow. Right. So, I mean, one of my clients I knew must have had 25 gallons of bleach in the basement. And just had to get rid of it. Well, the problem is you're talking about a dangerous chemical. Yeah. It's not like you can just pour it down the drain. Oh, that's right? true. Very true. All right. Yes. Um, a lot of a lot of times you have to take it like the towns, the, the, the town like uh, recycling center in many towns has like maybe once or twice a month, you know, collection of, you know, half empty paint cans or paint thinner or pesticide or whatever. Right. And you can bring it to them and they put it in a special container and they ship it to somebody who neutralizes it or whatever. Right. You know, I mean, even today, even with something like medications, if, you know, if a an elder family member passes away and they were on a lot of medications, people just used because so, so their kids wouldn't get to them or other people wouldn't get, they just take them and flush them down the toilet. Right. You can't do that anymore. No, because that yeah. stuff all goes into the waterway systems. Yes, it does. All right. And actually, there was an article I read a couple of years ago, which was very interesting about people dumping, you know, un unneeded drugs anymore, especially things like um, uh, antibiotics. Yes. Down the toilet and flushing them. Well, down the toilet and flushed goes down to the township water recycling, the water waste center, where they treat all that stuff. Yes. So that it can be released into the waterways as, as not even gray water, just clean water. Yeah. Um, but the problem with that, with that was creating was all those antibiotics. Yes, we're killing a lot of bacteria in the flushed water. Mm -hmm. But things like MRSA, vancomycin resistant enterococcus. Yes. All of those different superbugs. Yes. Were created by doctors without them knowing 
because for years, your mother might take you to the doctor. Well, she's obviously got something. I don't know if it's viral or bacterial, but I'm going to put you on an antibiotic just to be safe. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. And we, can, we consumed oodles and oodles and oodles of antibiotics. Yes. And what happens is just as we adapt to different things that we come into contact with, so do those little cells. Mm-hmm. And that's why MRSA, which is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, was created from just Staphylococcus aureus. Right. Because eventually some of it started to be able to resist the killing capability of antibiotics. Wow. And more are coming. Yeah. I don't doubt it. The fact that we only saw this pandemic a hundred and something years after the last one. Yes. It's not going to take 50 years for the next one. No, I agree with you. I I even only take a few years for the next one. Yeah. And I read an alert this morning about some other um, infection that's starting to move from country to country. Uh, But then I saw we had to schedule this time. So (laughs) when we're done. But I I have thoroughly enjoyed sharing my time with you this morning. Same here. Um, if, if you want to do follow-ups, I'm more I would love to do, to do that. follow-ups. Yes, um, definitely. And, you know, I mean, if you ever want to call just for some information, I'm happy to answer all your questions, my dear. Thank you so much. And for the public, can you just tell them where they can contact you, your website, sure. your, your phone number, everything that, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people, especially in the tri-state area in New Jersey, that are very interested in this because this could help a lot of people. So give us your contact information and, and let everybody know where they can find you. Okay. So my name again is Erwin Strohmeyer. I am the owner of Sterile Space Infection Defense, also lovingly known as the germ police (laughs) uh we're located in west orange new jersey the phone number is 973-714-8288 you can also look us up at our website at www.sterilespace.com you can find us on uh, facebook and linkedin and instagram as well we work seven days a week Uh, depending on the type of job that is, because if we're doing a full decon and and spray job, that's usually on weekends when nobody is in the building. Okay. But we, we offer a variety of services from residential to commercial. Uh, We can do vehicles as well as standalone buildings and homes, as I just said. Um, We offer a lot of information on our website. We do a blog um, that has tons of information on it. There are video testimonials from a number of clients on our website, which will give you a good idea of what we do. But if you really want to see something amazing, go to our website at www.sterilespace.com and watch the homepage video. It is something you've never seen before. It shows us in action and it really will open your eyes. Erwin, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for giving us all this valuable information. And I, you know, I am so glad that you came on and explained everything so thoroughly. And I'm looking forward to having you on the show again. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, and it's, I've got to say, the most enjoyable interview I've had in nine years. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much. I appreciate that compliment. You're very welcome, my dear. Talk to you soon. Yes. Talk to you soon.